Hello. Welcome. Good afternoon. Is that too loud? Good? All right. Perfect. Thank you for uh, joining. My name is David Amzik. I'm with Cyberox Software. Um, I've been with the company about 11 years, and all we do is focus on privilege. So today we're going to be looking at privilege accounts and how to be able to protect ourselves, meet audit, but not reduce operational efficiency. In order to be successful, we need to have a win on all three sides, and we also can't boil the ocean. So when I started, managing privilege accounts was purely a good idea. Then audit came about, and maybe we have PCI, SOX, NERC, and this was a subset of our environment. And we had to be able to simply show who has access to these accounts and who used the SA account at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. But then a couple of years ago, the breaches started happening. And now it was no longer just focusing on a subset of our IT, but how are the bad guys getting in? And initial thoughts were to say, well, okay, well, let's focus on what the bad guys are going after. Right? But as we dig into that, that sometimes becomes a very difficult question to answer because, you know, take national security. So this is from an actual meeting uh, on base. And when you think about which is the higher value target, the plane, anybody? No? The, the tank? The gas tank? That's exactly it. We said, I don't care, or I do care, but it doesn't really um, cripple us if one plane is hacked. However, there's a gas gauge on our fuel tank. And if somebody gets in and says that the gas tank is full and it's empty, it takes me three weeks to get my gas tanks filled back up. And without my gas tank, nothing works. So now, the question of what are the critical assets became even more difficult to ask because I've definitely been on site post-breach many times and it's not as though that there are people that drop down from the sky to help us fix the problem. So whether we're looking at this proactively or whether we're looking at it post-breach, this same challenge exists. We don't have unlimited time and resources, nobody can boil the ocean, and business cannot suffer with respect to meeting security. So when we start to look at how many privileged accounts they are, it's immense. Just in the old on-prem data center, we have not only things like local admin, root SA, but we have service accounts, databases, network devices, hypervisor, lights out management cards. We have applications that access databases, and guess what? Those have credentials as well. Now as we move into the cloud, securing access to the cloud, orchestration tools, all of these keys and secrets that are being created there, SaaS solution. Office 365, every SaaS solution has an admin account as well. All of these orchestration tools, Puppet, Chef, they all have privileged accounts. Endpoint, every laptop has a privileged account. Industrial control systems. We're not going to buy a new $5 million piece of manufacturing equipment simply because the old one has an XP operating system on it. So now we have this infinite number of privileged accounts and a very finite number of resources to be able to address it. So this is when organizations started coming to us and saying, don't give us a tool that can manage passwords, because a tool that can manage passwords is useless if we're not managing our passwords. Right. So the question next game, where do we start and how do we be able to build a program? And by the way, now we have the board asking about it as well. And if the board comes to executive management and says, solve privilege, that is a very loaded question. So what we want to be able to do is start off by reducing the most risk for the least effort, and have this be measurable. So executive management can go back to the board and say, this is what we have achieved. And as I said, three common themes throughout every step of this program are going to be an operational win, an audit win, and a security win. We need to have all three. If we're doing something for security that makes life miserable operationally, it becomes a painful, if not impossible, uphill battle. So before we look at how, I like to start off with the why. Let's look at what happens in a standard breach. And then once we can understand the why, then we can be able to start off by reducing the most risk for least effort. So this is going to be nothing new to the people uh, in this room. But all the breaches start off with a low value entry point. If my laptop is stolen, it does not hurt CyberArk. But if we have the same local admin password on all of our laptops, one is compromised, they're all compromised. And the bad guy goes laptop to laptop looking for hashes. Now, again, this is probably basic for most people in the room, but very high level. When I'm at work and I change my domain account, there's a hash on my laptop. So then when I'm on home, when I'm on an airplane, when I don't have network, when I'm not on the domain, there can be something local that says when I type in my username and password, can I log in? Right. Now, the bad guy doesn't care about me. 
But if Help Desk logs into my laptop, well, Help Desk logs in with their domain account, which is much more powerful than my individual account. That's the hash that the bad guy's looking for. Um, we had a CISO of a, a large organization that had been through a breach present at our customer event last year. And he said, I thought we were doing a great job. I communicated to the board that we are in good shape. We were changing our local lab and passwords on our workstations and laptops every 10 days. But we were changing them to the same password for all. And in hindsight, we would have been better off doing it once and not doing it again because 10 days was more than enough time for that bad guy to move laptop to laptop to find the hash they needed to get into the data center. And sometimes the bad guy just forces it. So let's say there's a phishing attack and I click on the link. Again, bad guy doesn't really care about me, but let's say they start filling out my C drive. My laptop starts moving slowly. So I call help desk. Help desk logs into my laptop to troubleshoot the issue, and then the hash is now taken. Now a hash is nothing magic. Once you change your password, the hash is null and void. But we can't expect our IT staff to change their domain account password after every time they work on a help desk ticket. So how do we be able to, to stop that? Right. And then when we look at the end game, the end game isn't to get to the server. The end game is to get to the domain controller. Because once they have the domain controller, at that point, they can be anyone, anywhere, anytime. Golden ticket attack. Now, the way they get from that help desk person's domain account, which is most commonly not domain admin or shouldn't be domain admin, the way they get from there to the domain controller is they start going server to server to server. And usually there's a small number of people who have domain admin as part of their individual or escalated account. And they're simply looking for a server where they logged in. Because now they've got the domain admin hash, which allows them to log into the domain controller, and that's the end game. Or it used to be the end game. Because once they had that, you can now be anyone, anywhere, anytime. You can write your own tickets. You can be a member of the staff. And then they would go for the database with the customer data of whatever was value and pull that out. The cloud added an additional chapter to the story. Because when they're going for the cloud, well now, when they've got the domain controller, they're not necessarily trying to get to the database. Now they're just going for the developer workstations. Because the developer workstations have SSH keys. And SSH keys are the key to the cloud. So that is the normal process. So if we understand this, and we accept the fact that our IT staff is not going to change their domain accounts after every time they use them, if we understand that there's way too many privileged accounts to tackle in the short term, there are some things that are easy, like local admin, but service accounts? Service accounts aren't technically difficult, but they create a lot of anxiety. They've never been done before. What happens if something breaks? We're going to get an exception, not our service account. So if we accept the fact that we can't boil the ocean, let's start off by reducing the most risk for the least effort. And what we've seen be successful is a 60-day sprint. What is the measurable risk reduction we can achieve in 60 days? And again, if it's board level, be able to then translate this, this risk reduction into an executive summary. Now, 60 days, it's not as though it takes us 60 days to do this. We've done this multiple times in a weekend, but nobody wants the rug to be pulled out from under them. Being able to do it over 60 days allows us to phase it in and be able to make sure that we're going to be successful. And for a larger organization, we may push that out a little bit, but 60 days is a good time period to focus on to basically do a few things. We like to think of it as a sprint fall by a marathon, and by the way, actually, just coming back to that airport example that I used at the beginning, it's not just the base. I actually met with an airport, and we said, you know, what are your critical assets? And they said, our baggage system, the, 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 la the, the Windows box that runs our, our baggage system. He said, the baggage system? He said, if the conveyor belt stops, we're done. Baggage is the heart of the airport. So again, when we look at industrial control systems, the goal is, yes, we're not going to do that as part of the sprint, but we want to make sure that we can manage these devices as we move forward. So when we look at this 60-day sprint, what is easy that nobody cares about? Local admin and root. These are high-risk accounts, but we almost never use them. Maybe the NIC card is down, and I need to log in locally. So for that outlier, I would go get that local admin account and use it. But day-to-day, -day, we're not using them. There's no service accounts. Nothing's going to break if we change them. Same thing with root and SA. So these are great starting points. However, what is the reason why most organizations did not put unique admin accounts on all the devices is the operational side. Whether we have 100 servers or 100,000 servers, if we have a static repository, a spreadsheet, a database, a vault, where we put these accounts, if we almost never use them, they're going to fall out of sync. And we do need them, they're going to be incorrect. 
So that's why the philosophy is let's have the same password for all. Okay. What we want to be able to do is replace a static repository with a dynamic repository. And we'll get into this more detail. But essentially, think of it as no different than if you hired somebody and said, here's our spreadsheet with our local admin and root accounts. Can you log into every server every day and just simply make sure the password in the spreadsheet is in sync with the password on the device? That's all we need to do to validate that those credentials are correct. If we have a, a dynamic repository, now having a unique root and local admin is no more operationally complex than previously it was to have the same password for all. If I'm a member of the IT staff, instead of going to that spreadsheet, and we've all had the situation where the password is wrong, I go to Cyberwork with my ED credential. Based on my group membership, I have access to the appropriate passwords. I know they're correct because of the verification. And we've met Audit, because now they're one-to-one. -one. So if Audit says who logged into Windows Server 23 at 2 o'clock on Tuesday, we can say it was Dave. So now we have the Audit reports to meet Audit, uh, all of the big four Audit firms being customers as well. That's where it started. So again, operational win, security win, audit win. Second, anyone have a vulnerability scanner? Qualys, Nessus, Rapid7, whatever it may be. Well, a vulnerability scanner has to log into all of your devices with a high power credential to run the scan. Guess what? It's not a person, but in applications can leave hashes as well. So your vulnerability scanner is leaving high power hashes all over the, all over the network. We have an out-of-the-box integration. So before your vulnerability scanner runs, it pulls the password from Cyborg. And after the password is done, we rotate it. Now, you don't need Cyborg. You can change that, that, uh, that vulnerability password after each use. Okay? And it's going to therefore solve the problem. But a lot of times, we don't have time. These things fall off. So being able to get those vulnerability scanners is very important. Now, commercially off-the-shelf applications are a great starting point. I always start off with a vulnerability scanner because security owns it. Okay? And they understand the risk. So let's start there. Let's get that nice risk reduction. It's no effort. But beyond that, and I'm sorry for this eye chart, but there's obviously a lot of security vendors. And nobody has the resources to stand up security silos. You need to buy, have different vendors, best of breed, obviously, but it needs to create a platform that's all linked together. So beyond, if we're looking at a proof point, if we're looking at two-factor, if we're looking at identity and access management, if we're looking at ticketing, if we're looking at a CMDB, same rules apply. So making sure that all of these things are talking together so one security solution isn't solving one security problem but creating another one. And the next thing that we want to do is we want to be able to isolate our high value assets. Now as I said, a high value asset, that's kind of a loaded question. So let's start off at the bottom. If we can say one of the most common attack vectors in every breach is your domain controller, then your domain controller is always going to be classified as a high value asset. In addition, if we build up from there, in addition to your domain controllers, we're also going to look at the AWS admin web console. Uh, we're going to look at PCI servers. We're going to look at databases with critical data as well. And I'll talk about how we isolate those in just a moment. Now, everything that I've talked about so far has really been focused on the IT staff. But laptops, Microsoft makes it black or white. We have full admin rights or we take them away. Now, when we take admin rights away, with GPOs, we can you know, put a little bit of effort in and we can get a good portion of the way there. But there's always exceptions, and that exception bucket tends to grow. I'm a developer. I need Application X to do my job. Application X needs admin rights. So therefore, I get full admin rights on my workstation. And then I'm a senior sysadmin. We can't predict the future. I may need to troubleshoot an issue tonight. Right? So we need to be able to make sure that we can fall, pull these into the fold as well. So what we want to be able to do is, again, see before we act. So let's run this in read only for a moment or for a couple of weeks. And we're going to see a bunch of stuff. But we can take some broad swipes at it. We trust everything from Microsoft. We trust everything from Adobe. We trust everything that's installed from this network share. Right? So now what we're doing is we're taking a lot of that stuff off the thing, and we can be able to make a business user policy. And as a business user, I can add a printer. When I add a printer, I'm given an admin token to add a printer, but I can't install whatever I want on my laptop. For that developer who's doing scheduled work, Application X is whitelisted. Next week, they need Application Y. This is scheduled. They submit a request to security. Security runs a scan on it. If it's OK, great. If it's not, we don't whitelist it. But the senior sysadmins are where whitelisting and blacklisting always falls short. And the only way we've seen it be successful is with graylisting. 
And with gray listing, we're simply saying, well, you can install whatever you want. You're trusted. You know, the odds of you installing ransomware on your laptop are low. But if you do accidentally get ransomware on your laptop, guess what? Ransomware needs to call home to get the encryption key. It just needs to access the internet to do so. What we simply say is an untrusted application cannot access the internet or can access network shares. So now we keep it confined. Right? Now there's also more, you know, I'm not going to get into the details, but there's also uh, credential theft and all, a lot of other stuff tied to that, but that's the basic concept. So that's a security win, that now we're not getting ransomware. The operational win, this is where admin rights start off as an operational goal. Because if all of our users can install whatever they want on their laptops, guess what? Our help desk calls are going to go up. So by doing that, by having this, people can install whatever they want, but they can install it to do their job. So we get the operational win, our help desk calls decrease. We have a security win. Um, and I don't think audit really so much plays into this, but if audit asks us about this, we can meet that as well. Okay. And finally, anomaly detection. We're not going to bat a thousand. We have applications with critical accounts. We need to be able to make sure that the stuff that we haven't got to yet, we can get a notification, but we can't get too many notifications because the moment we get too many notifications, it becomes a car alarm and nobody really thinks twice when they hear a car alarm. So I'll get into a little bit more detail on that anomaly detection in just a moment. But once this is done, we do a before and after, and we can actually show measurable risk reduction. Right? And again, what we've done here, nobody's had to change their day-to-day -day workflow. Everyone still uses their native tools. They do the same thing tomorrow that they did yesterday. But we've achieved a nice risk reduction. Now when we move beyond that, now we're going to look at things that aren't going to go as quickly, like service accounts. Now local admin, as I said, it's the same for all, so we can run very quickly. Service accounts are not the same for all. Different domain accounts have different service accounts tied to them. So we always want to, again, see before we act. So let's find the service accounts that are tied to that domain account. We can do that for you. Now once we see them there, maybe we pick one this weekend. We come in, we click the change button. We'll change the domain account. We'll change the service account. We'll restart the service account. If it works, great, we move on. If something breaks, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you'll find surprises. People took that uh, password because it was set to never expire and stuck it in a configuration file. When we have a problem, we go back. So we slowly start to rinse and repeat as we move through. Okay. Service accounts, databases, network devices, industrial control systems. We're agentless. We change passwords the same way a person does. If you've got some SaaS solution or some manu piece of manufacturing equipment that we've never heard of, we simply say, how do you as a person change that password? Do you SSH to it? Do you launch a web interface? And we have generic password handles to be able to uh, replicate that process. Um, another area that we'll get into a little bit more in the marathon is vendor access, provisioning, deprovisioning. Uh, we've definitely read about a couple of the major breaches that start off with a vendor account, one of them being an HVAC vendor. That HVAC vendor certainly wasn't a domain admin, but that was the way to the door. So we'll talk a little bit how we can bet better secure vendor access. Hard-coded credentials. So being able to tell the developers when you're building a new application, you don't have to hard code that credential in. We're just going to give you essentially a, a function call. We'll put, we'll give you a wrapper. So now when you're building a new application, instead of putting the username and password to access that critical database, just put a function call in there and that password can be pulled from CyberArk. And if it's a tier zero application, we can stick a mini vault right on the application server. Right? So everything has to make sure that when we've taken a step forward security, we're not reducing availability. Same thing with cloud. We have basic cloud hygiene. So when you have your AWS admin web console, you're going to treat that like any other root account. The only difference is when you connect to it, you're not going to use PuTTY, you're going to use HTTPS. Right. We're going to be able to manage that. The AWS key, which is the component that does the provisioning in the cloud. Well, much like Qualys, the AWS key is pulled from us. So we can make sure that that is secured. And then all of the instances that are spun up in the cloud, having the integration with all of the orchestration tools is key because now whatever orchestration tool we're using, all of the secrets, SSH keys, privileged accounts that are created just come into the fold. So when that instance is decommissioned, it's all automatic. Now, in the application world, when I talked about hard-coded application, when we talked about legacy devices, developers didn't want to not hard-code the password. They liked doing that. But when we get into DevOps, the, de the, the DevOps developers, um, don't want to put a static component into a dynamic process. As it moves through the life cycle, they don't want to have to change that password. So they're very much in tune to this. We have a community edition so the developers can just download and play for themselves. And now, whatever tool is the flavor of the week, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, whatever, when they throw it over the fence to security, security doesn't have to learn all of these tools. The hooks are already there. 
It's the same output, it's just a different tool. Now, what we talked about so far is the local admin account, the vulnerability scanners, but I also talked about isolating your domain controllers. And the question there comes, what, what do you mean by this? So I like to start off with Microsoft. Microsoft created some recommendations after the breaches, given that the vast majority of the breaches fall on their shoulders. Put a unique local admin. But when they look at, the old recommendation would be for our IT staff, our Windows admins, let's give them two accounts. Let's give them a Dave account and a Dave-A account. And my Dave-A account is going to be my admin account. Now that was the old recommendation, but if my Dave-A account is domain admin, then every time I log into a tier one server, I leave a hash. So Microsoft changed the recommendation. Now the recommendation is everybody has a low level ID account. Some people have server admin. Fewer still have domain admin. Fewer still have enterprise admin. It's four accounts. They also want a separate laptop. They call it a PAW, Privilege Account Workstation. So a laptop that is clean, that never goes on the network, that never goes on the internet, that's going to be used for connecting to the domain controller. But every time I've seen an organization try to implement four accounts and two laptops, it fails because of the operational complexity. And also, there is no, there is nothing stopping me. We're not counting human error. There's nothing stopping me from logging into a laptop with an enterprise admin account. So what our customers said is, we need to be able to meet the Microsoft recommendation, but we can't change anything about what we're doing today. We can't give people more accounts. We can't give people more laptops. So how can we do this? Well, we can do it through a web interface, but nobody likes change. And, you know, going to a web interface, if I need local admin, which is a once in a great while situation, fine. But as a Windows admin, I am not going to go to a web interface every time I want to log into the domain controller. So native tools are key. But just so we can see it here first, before we look at native tools, what could I do? I could log in. I could click on the domain admin account. The domain admin account is pulled from CyberArk and it's launched from a secure jump server. Because it is launched here, the password never gets back to my workstation. Therefore, we've met the privilege account workstation recommendation without having a separate laptop. Okay. Um, now, instead of giving me a third account domain admin, we put the Dave domain admin here. So now I just have two accounts. Right? I authenticate that it's me to CyberArk and CyberArk takes care of the Dave domain account. Right? So now I don't have another account to manage and that password can now be changed once a day and it's not really going to impact me. Right? The icing on the cake is we can record that session as well. I've never seen anybody record everything, but if we're talking about a vendor doing some work or you know a production code change, having a recording that's searchable uh, is definitely beneficial. And you can't have any single points of failure. So these are just a farm. Each one can support 100 concurrent RDP sessions, but if we put two behind a low balancer, 200, 300, 400, we can scale up to whatever we want. We can have them in different geographic locations, so the rendering, the user experience is native. So again, meeting the Microsoft recommendation without changing anything about what we're doing uh, today. And I'll show you how we can do that with native tools in just a moment. Right? Another use case for this is going to be if you have any compliance servers, if you have PCI, PCI 3.2. Well, PCI 3.2 requires, bless you, two-factor authentication. I can use my corporate 2FA if I'm logging in as Dave, but if I'm logging in as admin, Admin is a shared account. It's not tied to any one person, so you can't use two-factor. The way we help out here is you two-factor into CyberArk. So now if Audit says, who used Root at 3 o'clock on Tuesday? We can say it was Dave. And how can you prove to me it was Dave? Dave used two-factor authentication to access CyberArk. So now you get two-factor for shared accounts as well as individual accounts. So to meet PCI 3.2, we have two-factor. Entitlement report, who has access to the SA account on the PCI databases? who use the local admin at 3 o'clock on Tuesday, all of those reports pop out. As I said, that's something we've been doing for seven years because that's all people used to care about. Okay. Um, and then we have a secure jump server into our PCI zone or whatever device, zone, NERC, whatever it may be. The reason this is better than a traditional jump server is with a traditional jump server, you have to get the firewall rules perfect. Because what's to stop me if I am somehow able to get to that PCI database? Well, when I'm prompted for the SA password, that's where I'm stuck. The SA password only exists in the vault. So now the firewall rules become a good best practice, but we do have a catch-all. And finally, vendor access. If I'm an external vendor, 
there's always a concern. Well, the vendor doesn't have to have the same level of security on their workstation or laptop that we have that we have internally. So always the question is, well, you know, what happens? Well, we don't want anything on the vendor laptop to get in, and we don't want to get anything on the inside to get out. So if our v our vendor is coming in with VPN or Citrix, great. That that doesn't change. But now when they come in, we just give them access to the web interface, and we don't give that vendor a high level account. We give that vendor a low level AD account, and now. What they're going to do is they're going to authenticate. And what's been very popular is the concept of a functional account. There are certain default shared accounts that we can't get rid of. Local admin, SA, root, sys, system, enable. But functional accounts are something that was born from that. Now, let's, this can be used for local accounts as well as for AD account, domain accounts. Now, for security, local accounts are great because it's nice one-to-one, -one, but for management, Local accounts are terrible because I'm not going to log into 50 servers and change the local account password. So the concept works the same for both, but we've seen our customers shift to local accounts because if we can take care of the headache of making sure they're correct, auditing who's using them and changing them, then local accounts become no more difficult than domain accounts. So uh, to give you an example, let's say we create vendor 1, 2, and 3 as part of our Linux build. We then take these accounts and we put them in CyberArk and we ask CyberArk to be the gatekeeper. Now I as a vendor, I just have that low level AD account that I authenticate. I see the device that I want. Cyberark logs me in as vendor one, but vendor one is tied to me, Dave, so we have the audit. If two vendors need the same level of access at the same time, well that's why we don't have one account. Because if we have one account, then we have to share it and the accountability is gone. But by having a pool of accounts that are exclusive, vendor one is in use, I grab vendor two. Now you have the availability as well as the audit. This means you don't have to have a vendor account for every vendor. You just have to have enough for a point in time. At any point in time, how many vendors may need to access this device? Three? Let's put ten in there to make sure we never run out. As I said, it's no more difficult to manage one account than it is to manage ten. Same thing for, and we can have workflows. We can require that vendor to put in a reason, get an approval, integrate with a ticketing system. Same thing for fire call IDs to break glass accounts. We don't want people to use root. Root's all powerful and there's only one of them. So if we have fire call IDs, same rules apply. When that person day to day they log into themselves, they do their work, if they need a fire call ID, they can have access to it. And finally, sporadic access. Sometimes we give somebody a Dash A account, even though they only use it once in a while. Now this is not good uh, for them because they don't want to manage the account all year when they only use it once or twice. And it creates this risk because now we have more privileged accounts than we need. So a good best practice, again, is for those people that use their Dash A, their server admin account on a regular basis, give it to them. But if there's somebody that just needs it once in a while, why not have them check it out? Right. So that's the concept of the isolation. Right. And then just before we see it, as we talked about analytics, being able to look at an IT member. Day to day, I'm logging in as myself. I'm doing my work. Every once in a while, I need the SA account. It's going to build a user profile for me. So if somebody steals my credentials, or if I'm acting and I'm, uh, maliciously, that's going to be different than my normal. As I said, we recommend two-factor, but this is a nice catch-all. Sim, sometimes we have to write the rules. We write too many, we have too many rules. I'm sorry, we get too many alerts. All of the alerts become meaningless. So we do also have the ability to score those alerts. So if that application logs into a database every day at 7 a.m. and 4 p.m., and one day it logs in at 7.30 a.m., and it logs in from a different IP address, you can certainly write that rule within your own SIM, but you can always all le leverage the rules engine, so we do that for you. So now you get it, the SIM team is still getting on their SIM, um, but they don't have to write the rules themselves. And then there's also an agent that we can put on the domain controller, so we just watch the Kerberos traffic. So if there is a golden ticket attack, we can notify you in real time. I was on site post breach about nine weeks ago, and the organization said, We got a call from the FBI. And the FBI said, we're giving you a courtesy call. You've been breached. We've been investigating for seven months. Our investigation is now closed. Uh, you're welcome. Well, obviously, early detection is uh, beneficial. Um, so knowing that seven months earlier would have definitely helped out uh, the organization, especially being retail. Anybody doing DevOps? Nobody? All right, we'll skip it. So it's one thing to see it, and several people stopped by the, our, our booth and had some conversations. So 
I see several of you out there, so I'll just show it to you real quick here. But any questions so far? None? All right. All right. So, as I said, you can use two-factor, whatever you want. But as we said, you know, if we're talking about that outlier use case, the NIC card is down, I need the local admin account, you know, no big deal. I'll log in. I can grab the credential that I need. If it's, you know, again, if it's local admin and the NIC card is down, I can see it, but usually I'll just use the connect button. We talked about vendor accounts as well. So when I click on connect, it's going to log me into the component server as vendor one, but they're exclusive. If someone else needs it, they grab vendor two. So now we have the availability as well as the audit. So again, that's fine for an outlier, but if I need domain admin, I'm not going to come in and click on a connect button. Um, you certainly can, and you can give options, GPO or DNS manager, whatever you want. But what I want to do is I want to work the same way tomorrow as I did yesterday. And the way we're going to do that is with our native tools. And just to show you that there's no magic, there's no agent to do this. All we're doing is simply saying, instead of launching R RDP, GPO, or DNS manager toad from your workstation, launch it from that jump server that I talked about. So now, when I have my RDP connections manager, and I click on domain controller one, and I click on open session, today I type in my domain account, which has domain admin. Tomorrow, I type in my domain account, but it no longer has domain admin. What happens behind the scenes is Mike domain admin is pulled from the vault and launched from the jump server. We've met the Microsoft recommendation. The domain admin account never got back to my laptop. I don't have to use it, but I'm using my native tools. I can use Map a Drive, WinSCP, whatever I want. We've cha put security behind the scenes, and that's what we realized was critical as you move from just a vault to an enterprise standard. You have to put security behind the scenes. Same thing for the Unix team. Telling the Unix team that they have to use a web interface is going to be a very painful uphill battle. But here I'm saying, I'm Paul. I want to log in as root or firecall or vendor. This is the IP host name of the SSH proxy. This is the IP host name of the device I want to go to. Now I just type in my AD credentials. You can use two-factor here as well. So now I validated that I'm Paul and CyberArk validated that I have access to root. What happens is the root password is pulled from the vault, launched from the SSH proxy. Root password never got back to my workstation. I don't know or care if it's the same root password on every server or it's unique. I don't care if it changes after each use or never. All I care about is I have the access that I need and I'm working the same way I did yesterday, putting security behind the scenes. So if I do who am I? Root, but I never saw the root password. Any questions about that? Let's... Any questions about the sprint? What we do first, why we do first? Any concerns with that approach? Just out of curiosity, I mean, a lot of you have probably tackled the same, same challenge. Okay. All right, another thing that came up a bunch of times at the booth today was service accounts. And the big challenge with service accounts is where are they? So we need to be able to find them. And as we said, the reason why we take 60 days is because we don't want to pull the rug out. Let's pull the passwords in. Let's click on the verify button. So now we know that they're correct. We also going to schedule that verification process to make sure that if tomorrow I check out the local admin password and I change to something only I know, we want to find out about that proactively, not when there's an outage and it's not available. So this afternoon when the verification process runs, great. The password is, uh, password is wrong. We can notify you or fix it. So now we know that all of the passwords are correct. But if you don't have a nice process to pull from or you don't know where all of your service accounts are, well, it's very important that we can find them. So in this case, SVC under SQL is a domain account and no, it was set to never expire because we didn't know where the service accounts were. But if we can find the service account scheduled task application pools and we can see them, and most importantly, well, this is where they are, this being a demo environment, they're all in the same box, but in your environment, they would be on multiple. Then we can take the next step to be able to start to change them. And again, we want to just change them the same way you would. So 
when I come in during my maintenance window, instead of me changing this domain account and all the service accounts and having the ability potential to, to forget one or forget to restart something, well, all I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the change button. And when I click on the change button, it's going to first change the domain account, provide that successful. It'll then update the associated service account, scheduled tasks, application pools with the appropriate new password and also restart the service. And if I need to go back, we have the previous versions available to us. And then several other people also uh, asked a little bit about audit. So I'll touch on that as well. But again, when we look at that phased approach, regardless if you're doing it manually or with a tool, we want to start off by having a, a repository and we want to find a way to validate what's in that repository is correct. And then let's leave it there for two weeks. Let's give people the ability to use their old option or the new option. Then we say in two weeks, we're going to get rid of the old option. Now we go here to get local lab. We've solved that. We hook up the vulnerability scanner. We've solved that. We've isolated our domain controls behind the jump servers. We've solved that. Then we've slowly start to discover service counts. We start to change them. And then we start to rinse and repeat as we move through the environment. Okay. And then if it be internal audit, external audit, we need to be able to report on this data as well. So when we look at reports, again, just the interest of time here, a couple key ones is going to be an activity report. Well, who has, let's just open one up. I want to know who has access, sorry for the resolution here, to this specific target, who logged in as root at this time, we can conclusively say it was Paul, and if there was a reason or a ticket number like service now, whatever it's here. Target server, privilege account, who used it, when they used it, why they used it. If we want to know what they did, we can record what they're doing. But we do also have the ability to show who has access. So in this case, we can say, put this up. Who has access to the SA accounts on our PCI databases? Or what does in this case, John have access. So now we can conclusively show that John has access to these accounts and these accounts only. And lastly, as I said, the auditing byproduct is the ability to search. But I've never seen anybody have three hours to watch a, a recording of what somebody did on a device. You know, you certainly could, but that's probably not going to be ideal. More commonly, we're going to search for what we're looking for. So if I come here and I search for event, maybe I'm curious if somebody tried to delete the security event logs. I could watch the entire session, or in this case, it'll fast forward to the 43 second mark where we cleared the event logs. So we can see. Now again, even that's going to be overkill. So we do also with the analytics, we're going to alert you on high risk sessions. If somebody does an RM minus R, we'll, re we'll rank that as a high risk session. So if you're going to watch a couple sessions, it should be the one where an RM minus R is done rather than when someone um, just did it, who am I? Okay. Any questions on the reports or the recording? Any goals, requirements with respect to privilege accounts? Yes, please. Good question. I believe you can do a CSV file. You can save them. It, yes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that. But uh, you, what are you looking for, like a PDF or something? Yeah. Yeah. So Excel, definitely. I could take a follow-up stop by the booth, see if there's any, any others. Um, but although you can save that report, man, if, if it is in Excel, you can't modify the report within the vault. Any others on the reports of the recording? So a good way to think of all of this, you know, how do we logically set this up? Think of it like a bank vault full of safety deposit boxes. Safety deposit box is just a logical unit. Windows Local Admin, Windows Service Account, SQL SA, AWS, Office 365. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the appropriate logical passwords and put them in that safe. And then to it, we're going to tie the owners. Well, who on the IT staff should have access? And again, if you've got a, you know, a sale point involved, all of the governance goes back. So now we can show what does Dave have access to as Dave and what does Dave have access to from a privilege perspective. And also, we piggyback off that group membership. So as my group membership changes, so does my access. Okay. So in summary, we're going to create a logical unit where we put a subset of like passwords. To that logical unit, we're going to tie the individual or 80 groups. Who has access to the passwords in that safe and what access do they have? We could say that a senior sysadmin has access whenever they need it, but a vendor needs approval. 
And then secondly, we'll tie it to a policy. Do these passwords change? If so, when? Password notification, etc. So therefore, that allows us to be granular. We can say, okay, local admin, which creates us a lot of risk, let's just have that password change after each use. But service accounts, just because we can change them, doesn't mean uh, that we're going to schedule them to change, so be able to have different policies for different subsets of systems. But what I'm going to finish up on in the last two minutes here is people always say, is there anything that we can do in the short term? Right. Well, in the short term, there are some basic things that we can do. Stale accounts. Accounts that haven't been used in a couple of years, how are we going to say stale accounts, whether it be a vendor account, an employee who left, whatever it may be. Getting rid of those accounts is not often that very difficult to do and it reduces a lot of risk. Number two, for service accounts. If a service account is not running on the domain controller, it does not need to be domain admin. So simply reducing the permission can have a nice risk reduction without any changes. Decommission servers, servers that we thought were decommissioned but are still sitting on the network. And finally, pass the hash. So if there's any interest, there is a no charge tool which can actually go out and do this. You can do it on an OU, a couple IP addresses, um, what, what happens. have you. But probably the most important aspect of this is it will actually draw a pass the hash map for you. And with a pass the hash map, this is what I was talking about at the beginning, how the breaches happen. So if I, for example, log into the server or laptop with my domain admin account, when I log out, I've left the domain admin hash, which means that as long as that hash is valid, the bad guy can ha take it and use it to log into all of these devices. Now obviously you're not going to, or I'm not going to say obviously, but most likely you're not going to change all of your domain admin accounts. But let's say Jill logged into a laptop with a server admin. Now you have a server admin hash running around on a laptop outside your network. This is the last thing that you want. You can say, Jill, can you please change your password and please don't log into laptops within the future. So again, measurable risk reduction. If you're not looking to start a privileged account program for a period of time, this is a nice way to find that low-hanging fruit. You can do some of this cleanup manually. You can show some measurable risk reduction. Again, it's all about you know, getting rid of the easiest things. The bad guy is always going to go for the easiest way in. If we close some of those doors, we reduce our risk. But certainly beyond that, doing red team exercises, a penetration test is you know, more or less the past. Penetration test is can the bad guy get in? It's been proven time and time again. You know, Patching. We say, oh yeah, if we had just got all of our patching done, the bad guy wouldn't have been able to get in. Equifax would not have happened. The problem is there's too many needles in the haystack. There's too many servers. We can't patch every day a patch comes out and the bad guy is looking at the patches that come out and using those against us. We can't expect that there's going to be no vendor accounts left over. So if we can't, if we accept the fact that we cannot bullet close the entire door and that we are no longer living in the past, we can say we have a firewall so we're protected. If we accept the fact that the bad guy is going to get in, then penetration tests, yes, are helpful. We should do that. But what we also want to consider is when the bad guy does get in, what is the easiest path to what they're doing? So definitely, I think maybe the last presentation was on that red team exercises to be able to see beyond those basic things that I just said, local lab and vulnerability scanners and isolating your domain control, which again, you don't need Cyberarch to do these things. These things can be done manually. That's your basic hygiene that you want to start off with. Um, and then once you get that, doing some red teaming exercise to be able to find other privileged path pathways and be able to slowly start closing those other doors as time goes on. Okay. And that's where we will finish up. Lockdown credentials, starting off with the easiest, moving down the pike, isolating sessions to your domain controllers at a minimum, and continuously monitor and reevaluate as the attacker actors change, as the bad guys come up with new and better ways. We always want to be reevaluating what we're doing so that as time changes, we change with it. The goal is to be able to stay as close to a step ahead as possible. Right. So I think that brings us to just about the quarter after mark. Um, I figured I'd leave the last few minutes for any questions, use cases. Yes. So Yep. Good question. It's all relative. Whether you have 10 people on the IT staff and 100 servers, 
or whether you have 100 people on the IT staff at 1,000 or 1,000 on the IT staff at 10,000, the one constant is that you don't have enough time and resources. So I would say, you know, a few years ago, um, it was more organizations that were like 25 IT staff and up. Um, now, the, the, if, a, if an organization that's small is breached, sometimes that's not even recoverable. You know, an Equifax, an Anthem, a Target, a breach is going to cause considerable harm, but it's not going to be the end of the day for them. For a small organization, it is. So an organization that has five people on the IT staff is definitely a good target. Um, obviously, there's going to be less service. It's going to take less time. And obviously, relative cost is going to be significantly less. But it is essentially the same challenge across the board. Yeah. Does that answer the question? OK. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So, I mean, whether you have one domain control or you have 50, again, you have less stuff to isolate, but you do have to do it. And again, you can try it manually, you can take a look at it, and you can make a decision, but it is definitely nobody would buy it. Um, if Nobody would buy a tool if they could do it manually cheaper, and nobody would buy a tool um, if it's going to be, you know, we could solve world hunger, and nobody would buy it if it costs too much money. So again, it has to be, have the technical benefit as well as the budgetary benefit to be successful regardless of the size. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So the pricing model is, is defined so that basically based on the number of users. So if you have two people on the IT staff, you're going to be paying a lot less than if you have 2,000 people on the IT staff. That's how it, that's how, that's the way it's able to scale because it scales the same way an organization does. So as an organization grows, as they bring on more devices and more IT staff, well, it's a relative growth along with the, the, the growth of the infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. Please stop by. Yep. Any others? Yes, please. Yes. Yep, absolutely. So what we can do is we can launch any, we have a universal connect. You can launch Toad, SQL Server Management Studio, Putty, whatever you want from the jump server. So the way that would look, very quickly, If I log in as a DBA, and again, you can do this with your native tools, and I click on Connect, well, now it's going to launch SQL Server Management Studio. It can either launch it locally from my laptop and just programmatically inject the credential, or if it's a critical database, we can launch it from the jump server. But this is being launched from the jump server, but it feels native. I can move the window around, I can resize it, I can open up 10 at the same time. So it doesn't matter what client you're using, as long as you can launch that client, you can support that. Um, very important point. Telling people to use this tool tomorrow when, they, when they're used to that other tool is very difficult. So we, won't, we can't expect the IT staff to, uh, to acclimate to security. It has to be a joint partnership. Thank you. Any other questions? I thought that's all. One more?